Okay, welcome to Chapter 9. This is for Nassau Community College, AHS 131 MB, lecture on Chapter 9, the joints or the articulations of the bones between each other. This is your lecture. Part, part of this will be in your lab. And uh, we are doing this presentation so that you have this to view. And then we will do another lab later on Saturday, and that lab will be um, more on muscles. Okay, so the joints um, contrast the different major categories of joints. We'll look at their relationship between structure and function. Describe the basic structure of a synovial joint. That's a key joint. Uh, synovial joints are usually the freely movable joints. Describe how the anatomical and functional properties of synovial joints permit movements of the skeleton. In other words, the way they're designed, if there's a lot of room, they're going to move. If there's little room, they're not going to move well. And describe joints between the vertebrae and the vertebral column. And we'll also look at other joints, such as the elbow, the knee, the shoulder, the hip. And we'll discuss aging on joints, how, how it affects joints, and discuss the most common age-related clinical problems with joints and explain the functional relationships between the skeletal system and other body systems. So what is a joint? It's an articulation where two bones meet, where the body movement occurs. You can't have movement if you didn't have joints. It would be one big stiff rod. A trade-off exists between strength and mobility. Okay, so there's basically two classification schemes. One is the structural or anatomical scheme and the other is the functional or range of motion. So joint structure determines the function and structural classifications such as, is it a fibrous joint, cartilaginous joint, a bony joint, or a synovial joint? So the functional classifications are more based on how does it move? So a synarthrosis means it's immovable. An amphiarthrosis means it's slightly movable and a diarthrosis means it's freely movable. So a synarthrosis or a movable joint are very strong. The edges of the bone may touch or interlock. There may be some other tissues like fibrous connected tissue or cartilage, and there's four basic types of synarthrotic joints. The suture in the skull, where you have like the sagittal suture and the lambdoid suture and the coronal suture, See how the bones interdigitate and they come tightly knit together. It's bone to bone. The gomphosis, which is in the teeth, in the alveoli socket. The synchondrosis between the actual bone uh, growth plate. And the synostosis is when a bone fuses. Those growth plates actually fuse. So let's talk about synarthrosis. A suture found only between the bones of the skull, the edges of the bone interlock, like I just said, bound by a dense fibrous connective tissue. In the teeth, we have a gomphosis joint that binds the teeth to the bony socket. And there is a periodontal ligament that holds it in place. Synarthrosis, synchondrosis. Now it's another immovable joint called the synchondrosis. And that's the rigid cartilaginous bridge between two bones. It's found between the vertebral sternal and the ribs and the sternum, and also the growth plates of the cartilage on growing long bones. A synostosis is created when two bones fuse. For instance, actually, as we develop our frontal bones, we mentioned this when I first started teaching the skull, that the frontal bone actually is two separate bones with a myoptic suture. That tends to fuse early. Uh, and also the epiphyseal lines of the growth plate where the cartilaginous growth plate was, they've become an epiphyseal line. So that's also considered to be a synostosis. An amphiarthrosis means that the joint is more movable than a synarthrosis, but not freely movable. So it moves and gives. So they're stronger than diathroidal joints, which are the freely movable joints we're going to talk about in a moment. And uh, there are two types of amphiarthrosis. One is a syndesmosis, that means it's connected by a ligament. And one is a symphysis, which means the bones are connected by a fibro cartilage, like in the pubic symphysis. <clears throat> now, synovial joints are diathroidal joints. 
They are freely movable joints and at the ends of every long bone. They're surrounded by a joint capsule, sometimes called the articular capsule, and in some places they have special names. And it contains synovial membrane. A synovial membrane wraps around it and then there's a fluid within called the synovial fluid. That synovial fluid comes from the synovial membrane, actually produces that synovial fluid. And it fills the joint cavity. And if you remember, we talked about the um, thixotropic nature of the synovial fluid. What does that mean? I said it meant, it mean, it's like ketchup. Ketchup at rest is very thick. If you suddenly accelerate, it goes from thick to thin. And it follows a non-Newtonian physics, meaning for every action, there's not an equal and opposite reaction because if it's a sudden acceleration, it becomes very thin and things can slide very easily. When it doesn't move suddenly, it's slow movement, the, the fluid stays very thick and mucoid-like. Imagine you're walking in mud up to your knees. It's very hard to walk in mud. And then all of a sudden, somehow, somebody takes a big hammer and bangs on the mud and it turns into liquid. That's kind of how synovial fluid functions. If it's suddenly accelerated with, a, with an impact like that, it becomes like a fluid. Okay, then there's articular cartilage that covers the joints. So in a synovial joint, you have a membrane, synovial membrane, you have a synovial fluid, and the synovial fluid is produced by a synovial membrane. And then on the articular cartilage, on each bone, there's a little bit of hyaline cartilage we learned about in the last lecture. And that prevents the direct contact between the bones and allows for a smoother movement. So here's an example of a typical synovial joint. If you look at this, let's look at where the articular cartilages is, are, <laughs> right in the middle, the blue, the two blue ends on the ends of each one of these bones. This looks like a typical synovial joint of the interphalanges of your fingers, right? It's a great way to understand joints. When you, and also, um, there's a famous medical doctor orthopedist who teaches manipulation I think it's John J. Minnell, and that's how he teaches by, by looking at your fingers and manipulating fingers, teaching you about bony manipulation, manipulating joints. But so the articular cartilages here are actually protecting the ends of the long bone and allow for a nice smooth glide. And then there's a fibrous joint capsule surrounding it and a ligament that usually connects bone to bone. So if you look at the ligament on the outside, the next layer would be the fibrous joint capsule, which would surround the entire joint, I'm just showing us cut. And then the next thing you would have is the synovial membrane. The pink or blue there, or, I'm, or red, is actually meant, try to, uh, trying to represent the synovial membrane. And then there would be a fluid in there. And that fluid is thick at rest, but when it's suddenly accelerated, it changes from thick to thin. And what does that mean? The coefficient of movement of the joint changes. It could slide very easily. And this is important in trauma. It's also important in trying to manipulate vertebrae or, or articulations, synovial articulations. It shows you the metaphysis, that line there where it stopped growing. Uh, it's, it, that's where the growth, growth line is now. If it was a growing child, there'd be cartilage there as well. And then there's compact bone there. And even up top, you can see the medullary cavity, spongy bone, and the periosteum. Here is a knee. So this is the accessory structures of a knee on the right. And then you see some of the muscles and tendons there on the left, showing that, pointing that out. But notice the top bone is the femur coming to meet the tibia. That's where most of your weight bearing is in the knee. And then in between, you're going to have a meniscus on either side. And so this is a lateral view. Actually, it's a sagittal section. And you're looking at it from the lateral view, I believe, here. And you can see a patella in the front. And then there's a bursa. A bursa is a fluid-filled sac made up of a synovial membrane-like material. And that fluid fill sac helps to cushion things. So notice you have a bursa on top of the knee. Then you have a couple of bursas be below the tendon, between the tibia and above the tendon. Bursas are found wherever there's going to be pressure on things. Look at the posterior knee. There's a bursa in the popliteal fossa there. And then you can see the synovial membrane surrounding the femur. 
and surrounding the tibia, and there would be synovial fluid in there. It also shows here some ligaments here. Uh, we're going to look at it from another view, which would be easier. We'll look at it later. So synovial fluid has the consistency like of an egg yolk and contains proteoglycans. Remember we talked about it's a protein with a sugar. And the primary functions include lubrication, nutrient distribution, and shock absorption. Synovial joints are mobile, but relatively weak. So a synovial joint is, moves very easily, but they're not as strong as the uh, other, jo other joints. We talked about the syn synchondrosis or the ar amphiarthrosis, synarthrosis or amphiarthrosis, but the synovial joints are freely movable, yet they're weaker. They're more susceptible to damage. And there are accessory structures associated with it, like cartilage, fat pads, ligaments, tendons, and bursa to support it. Cartilage can be formed into what's called a meniscus, like the fiber cartilage pad between two opposing bones, or you can have fibrocartilage that becomes the fibrocartilage disc in the vertebrae. You have fat pads, adipose, covering the synovial membrane to protect and it protects the articular cartilage. You have ligaments that support. Now ligaments are designed to go from bone to bone to hold it in place so it doesn't get completely pulled out of joint. And each ligament has a different purpose. And there's some ligaments that are just there for, not so much for strength, but for other reasons. So if you have a sprain, that means the ligament is damaged. If you have a strain, it's usually muscle and tendon. So whenever you hear this term sprain strain or strain sprain, the strain portion has to do with the muscle and the tendon being damaged, but the ligaments didn't get damaged. When you have a sprain, you actually tore some of the fibers in the ligament, and that's a serious problem. That's one step away from a complete dislocation. Now, tendons attach muscles to bones and usually around the joint. And if a muscle crosses a joint, it's going to have an action on that joint. So that's an important thing to keep in the back of your mind. When muscles cross a joint, it usually has an action on that joint. And so the bursae are these little small pockets of synovial fluid I mentioned earlier. They're like, imagine if you could sew a little pillow using synovial membrane, but within the pillow, it's filled with synovial fluid and helps to cushion areas where tendons or ligaments would rub up against other things. What are some of the factors that stabilize synovial joints to prevent injury by limiting range of motion? So we want to have nice, strong collagen fibers of the joint capsule and ligaments. The shapes of the articulating surfaces and menisci are important. Other bones, muscles or fat pads, and tendons. Movements are described in terms that reflect a plane or direction of movement. So when we look at synovial joints, they have a lot of movement so that you can measure the movement in different planes of direction and their relationship with structures. So planes of movement could be only in one plane. That would be monaxial, like an elbow. Or it could be in two planes. That would be biaxial, like the wrist. You can flex it, extend it, and you can also... Um, abducted or adducted and then triaxial means you have three planes and the shoulder has the most freely movable joint in the body and we'll look at those planes in a moment so some of the types of movement at synovial joints could be just a gliding movement against each other an angular movement where they bend on each other or a complete combination of several movements like flexion extension lateral flexion and rotation and that would be called circumduction so like I said, rotation and special movements. So here's a simple model of an articular motion that's possible. And this is showing the pencil representing a bone and the desk is the articular surface of another bone. And a lot of twisting, pushing and pulling would demonstrate that there's only three ways to push and pull a pencil. See, so you have this movement. It can only glide and slide several ways, right? And so gliding and sliding is one way things move. And then you can also have angular motion. And that's where it actually is. Uh, movement number two shows the pencil can sh uh, the pencil shaft can change its angle with the surface. And you're moving it from different angles. 
and then you could change the shaft angle and you can do circumduction. It's a combination of those movements. Rotation is just spinning on an axis. So if you look at the shoulder, the most freely movable joint in the body has over seven articulations, but it can move superior, straight up and down, gliding, and inferior. It can move lateral and medial, and it can move anterior and posterior. So that's a gliding movement of it. When two flat surfaces slide past each other, such as in the carpal bones, they glide as well in the wrist. So angular movement, flexion and extension are movements in the anterior and posterior plane. So angular movements mean that's moving on an angle. So flexion means you're decreasing the angle between the two articulating bones. Remember I taught in class, if you bend your elbow like you're, like you're doing an arm curl, you're flexing the, the elbow. The forearm is coming closer to the upper arm, the brachium, and that is actually coming close to each other. So it's decreasing the angle between the bones. As you extend out, the angle is increasing, right? So that's extension. Hyperextension means you've gone past the normal anatomical position. So for instance, anatomical position, your arms are at your side, your palms facing forward. If you were to bring your arms straight back behind you, that would be extension. Okay. So looking at this lady here, she's going to be doing flexion of the forearm. See that? Uh, the elbow. You see flexion of the head is coming down and closing off that. And then flexion of the hip, you see the knee coming up. If she was to extend the hip, see how the leg goes behind her? That's extension or sometimes in anatomy books, we call it hyperextension, but in clinically we call that extension because you're going hyperextension because you're going past anatomical position. And then you see the arm, they're not showing the arm in extension, but going back from the flex position could be considered extension. And hyperextension is when you bring your hand way back behind you. And you see the neck going into flexion and extension. Then there's a little picture there showing the wrist flexion and wrist extension. We've done this in class. Okay, so angular movement. We have abduction and adduction in the frontal plane. So if you're looking straight at a person and they bring their, bring their arms up to for the side like they're flying like an airplane, they move the arms away from the body so they're being ab, abducted. When they bring them back to the body, that means you're adding it to the body so they're be, becoming adducted or adduction is occurring. So here's a picture. She brought her arms up, abduction, she brings it back, adduction, brings her leg up, abduction, brings it back, that's adduction. And even in the wrist, in anatomical position, the thumbs are out, you bring the thumb outward, that's abduction, you bring the pinky inward, that's adduction. The fingers can abduct as well, except the middle finger tends to stay right where it's at. You could move your finger either way, but generally speaking, it's all abduction and adduction is in relative relationship to the central digit, which is your middle finger. <clears throat> Circumduction is a complete circular movement without rotation. <clears throat> Here you go. He's moving that, or she's moving that all over the place there. And then rotational movement in reference to anatomical position. So if you're looking to the left with your head, that's left rotation. If you look to your right, that's right rotation. And then the limbs, you can actually medial and laterally rotate the shoulder and the leg, the thigh. So they can medially rotate and externally rotate as well. Let's see that. Head rotation, and then you see the arm, how it rotating medially. Now he's rotating, she's rotating up here on this. So it's spinning at this joint. Because you can spin here too. And that would be pronation. Let's look at that, see if we have that here. So pronation is when you rotate the forearm so that the radius rolls across the ulna. So the radius moves and the ulna stays put. And then supination turns the palms outward again. So here's a picture. So he went from the supinated position and he flipped it over. That's pronation. 
and then from pronation back, that's called supination. And if you notice, the radius, the ones that pivoting over the ulna. <clears throat> By the way, there is a video on my on my uh, YouTube page of the shoulder and the elbow, and I use that to teach the occupational therapist in kinesiology, and it goes over a lot in more detail the shoulder and the elbow. It's actually very good to watch if you wanted to watch it. And there is a nice uh, little tutorial within the elbow showing um, complete tutorial on the on the elbow, I believe, from a medical doctor. It's actually an animation. It's pretty good. Okay, so special movements called inversion and eversion, dorsiflexion and plantiflexion. So we're talking about the foot. When you bring your foot inward, like bringing the great toe, your big toe, and that, that whole medial side of your foot up towards your head, like pulling it up, like there was a string attached to it, that's inversion. When you push it out laterally, that's eversion. When you walk like a duck on your heels, you're bringing your toes up, that's dorsiflexion. When you walk on your tippy toes like a ballerina, that's plantar flexion. Here's inversion here on the right, our reading right, and eversion is on our reading left. Dorsiflexion up, plantar flexion down. Now there's another couple of special movements such as opposition, reposition, protraction, and retraction. Now opposition, you take your thumb and you put it together with your pinky. That's opposition, the opposable thumb. Reposition is just bringing it back. Protraction is when you're taking your scapula and it's rotating around the ribs going forward. Now again, in the video on the shoulder, I mean the uh, animate, excuse me, the YouTube narration of the shoulder that I did for the OTs, has a really cool video set of a guy doing scapula exercises. And ladies, you're probably going to like it. Okay, so then protraction is bringing the scapula forward, like you're reaching out to grab something in front of you, and the scapula rotates around the ribs. When you bring it back, like you're pinching your shoulder plates back, that's retraction. Here's opposition, thumb to pinky. And here's retraction and protraction of the, of the mandible. So when you pro project the jaw forward, that's protract protraction. When you bring it back, it's retraction. So you can protract and retract the mandible, and you can also do that with the scapula. So depression is when you're moving a structure down. Elevation brings it up, and lateral flexion is bending to the side. So here, the woman opens her mouth. That's also called depression. And when she closes it, it's also called elevation. Lateral flexion of the head and neck is tilting your ear towards your shoulder. Classification of synovial joints, plane, gliding, hinge, condylus. Okay, so now synovial joints are further classified as a plane joint. That means they glides. A hinge joint, like the elbow, just work, moving, moving on a hinge. A condylar joint, which is more ellipsoid. A saddle joint, the bone sits like it's in a saddle. And a pivot joint is like a pivot point on a, um, like a bat. If you had a bat and something was pivoting around it, like a donut that goes on the back and is pivoting around it. And then you have the ball and socket. So here, uh, a plane joint is flattened or slightly curved surfaces. It's limited motion. It's non-axial. A hinge joint has an angular motion, single plane, one plane. Condylar joint is oval articulated surface with a depression like in the jaw, going the, the, the mandibular process or the mandibular condyle sits within the mandibular fossa of the temp, TM, temporal bone. And that forms a temporal mandibular joint. And that has two planes of motion. So here's a plane joint just gliding and sliding. You see that where the ribs meet the sternum. And here it is, uh, here's a hinge joint like the elbow. And here is a condylar joint, like at the wrist. And this, uh, uh, saddle joints are articular surfaces, uh, I'm sorry, articular faces fit together like a rider in a saddle. And it's usually biaxial, only moves on two mo range of motion. A pivot joint is rotation only, that's monoaxial. And a ball and socket joint, a round head and a cup. And it's usually triaxial. 
So here's a saddle joint. It's showing you an example of the metacarpals and the carpal bones, the carpal metacarpal joint. It's between the trapezium here and then also the metacarpal. So that would be which trapezium, what is the trapezium, left or right? What side is that on? Okay, so you want to look that up. Make sure you know that. Okay, and then the pivot joint is something just pivoting around a central axis, and you can see the axis vertebrae has that dense, and then the atlas pivots around it, has a strong ligament wrapping around it. A ball and socket like the shoulder and the hip, it's rotating around um, a cup. And the intervertebral joints, the first two vertebrae are unique. They're a, it, they are, they're a what? Atypical. They're not like the rest. So you have the atlas and the axis. So the the first two cervical vertebrae are joined by a synovial joint between the dens and the atlas. And then there are synovial joints above and below on all the vertebrae. All the articulating facets, superior and inferior articulating facets, they have hyaline cartilage, a synovial membrane, synovial fluid. Then there's also an intervertebral disc between the vertebrae that goes between the two vertebral bodies, and it has a tough annulus fibrosis outer layer of fibrocartilage with a lot of fibrous connected tissue, and what helps attach the disc to the vertebrae. And then within there's this nucleus propulsus, which is a a gelatinous type core and it helps to absorb shock and then the vertebral end plates there's a little bit of cartilage on there as well to cover superior and inferior surface of the disc so if you have damage to the intervertebral disc a bulging disc is a bulge in the annulus fibrosis it can invade the vertebral canal where the spinal cord is and it can also invade the intervertebral canal where the nerves come out and a herniated disc is when the nucleus pulposus literally breaks through the annulus fibrosis and can actually come out onto materials and compress nerves. So here's an example of a normal disc above between T12 and L1. And then they're showing between L1 and L2 a bulge. They don't show the nerves here. Here they're showing a herniated disc, a herniated nucleus pulposus. Sometimes it's abbreviated as H. NP, herniated nucleus pulposus. So if you ever read that, that's what that means. And you can see that the material is pushing out on an area where the, where the fibrocartilage was damaged and those fibers get torn to the point eventually something could just squirt right out. It doesn't squirt out, that it just pushes out and it's pressing on that nerve. It's causing a lot of inflammation and a lot of, and can shut down that nerve flow. And those nerves go to many parts of your body, not just the bone, muscles, and skin, but also to your organs. So what you see here in the center, you can see the spinal cord going through the vertebral canal. And then the disc is sitting right on top of the vertebral body, but this disc is actually herniated. It's going, pressing back into the nerves. So the vertebral column moves, the nucleus pulposus compresses, and the disc shape conforms to motion. It's interesting to note that before B.J. Palmer developed chiropractic, medical doctors had no idea that the vertebrae moved. And they really didn't understand the disc until chiropractic came along. They didn't understand that the disc could do these things and disc, things could press on nerves. So the disc shapes conform to the motion. And then there's intervertebral ligaments that connect the vertebrae to each other and they stabilize the vertebral column. Some of the intervertebral ligaments here are the ligamentum flava. That's an, an interesting ligament because this ligament is not a very strong ligament, but helps to contain the spinal cord between the posterior aspect of the spinal cord and the lamina of each vertebrae. The posterior longitudinal ligament is right up against the posterior bodies and the spinal cord is running in between the ligamentum flava and the posterior longitudinal ligament within the vertebral canal. The anterior longitudinal ligament is in front of the vertebrae, in front of the body, and that connects to all the anterior surfaces of the vertebral bodies. So here in this picture, this is an anterior view and what you're seeing in the front 
is the anterior longitudinal ligament, which will check the movement of extension. So as you bring your body back or head and back, that's going to prevent it from going too far. And then the ligamentum flava doesn't really do much protection as far as limiting movement. It just protects the cord area. But then the posterior longitudinal ligament, I don't know if you can make this out, but that is in the posterior side of a tibial body it helps to form the anterior uh, wall of the vertebral canal. That's where the spinal cord goes through. So there's also on the posterior side behind all that stuff is the spinous processes, right? So you have an interspinous ligament connects from spinous process to spinous process. You have a supraspinous ligament that connects the tips of the spinous processes all the way down to the sacrum from C7. And then above from C7, it's called the ligamentum nuchae. Remember, we talked about that with the EOP. So here's a nice image showing you the ligaments. If you look to the left of the screen and you can look at the supraspinous ligament all the way to the left on top of the spine and then the interspinous ligament in between so you can actually see the nucleus propulsus there in the disc you see the intervertebral foramen you can see the articulating facets and then you can see the spinal cord running through and the nerves coming out so vertebral movements include flexion extension lateral flexion and rotation the elbow joint includes a hinge joint which is really for flexion extension and that's between the humerus and the radius and the ulna. But then there is a joint between the ulna and the radius. So you have the humeral ulna joint between the ulna and the humerus. That's the largest one. So that's the one with the hinge joint when you bend your elbow. And so it has a trochlea and a trochlea notch. And the humeral radial joint is for between the humerus and the radius. And that's where it allows the capitulum, allows the head of the radius to spin within its space while it's held tightly to the to the um, ulna structures of the elbow so in the biceps brachii muscle attaches to the radial tuberosity coming from the shoulder area from two parts the coracoid process and from the supraglenoid tubercle the both of them come into the uh, radial tuberosity to control elbow motion, most of it. There are other muscles in the elbow. There's also the brachialis deep to that, which we'll learn. And then there's ligaments of the elbow. You have the two strong ligaments that hold the elbow together more. That's the radial collateral and the ulnar collateral ligament. That's the strong points. The annular ligament helps to keep that radial head in its place. And if that was damaged, the radial head could dislocate out. And I have that video, if you wanted to see that at my YouTube, of the elbow. And it has some good stuff on it. So here you're seeing the radial collateral ligament. That means it's on the lateral side. Sometimes they call it the lateral collateral ligament of the elbow. And then the annular ligament, you can barely see wrapping around the head of the radius. And if you can't see the medial collateral, the ulnar collateral, because that was on the medial side. But now you can see it. There's the ulnar collateral ligament. See the ulnar, the olecran on the ulna. And then you have the articular capsule. And then now you can see a better view of the annular ligament. And then you can see that tendon of the biceps muscle comes into place there, right into the radial tuberosity. So knee joint, complex joint. Um, it ha it's a hinge joint though, and transfers the weight from the femur to the tibia. There's three articulations, two femur to tibia articulations, and one between the patella and the patella surface. So the joint capsule and joint cavity of the knee has a medial and a lateral meniscus. It has fibrocartilage pads or menisci. It has at the femur tibia, femur tibia articulations, and it has a cushioning and stabilizing joint. Okay, so the knee has seven major supporting ligaments. You have the patella ligament. That's where the quadriceps come into. And they insert onto the tibial tuberosity. And then you have two popliteal ligaments posteriorly. 
and then in the anterior and posterior, posterior cruciate ligaments that are inside create like a crisscross and then you have the medial or tibial collateral ligament and the lateral or fibula collateral ligament let's look at it there's your tibial or medial collateral ligament on the medial side and this would be your lateral collateral ligament or fibula collateral ligament. This is your quadriceps tendons coming in and they help to insert into the patella ligament into the tibia. And now here's an image looking at it from the anterior again. So this would be your tibial tuberosity right here with everything removed, I believe. Medial lateral, yes. And then this is your posterior cruciate ligament. This is your anterior cruciate ligament. See how they make a crisscross? That's your medial condyle, the femur, lateral condyle. This is the lateral meniscus. This is the medial meniscus. Okay. And then on the posterior side, we can see some of the ligaments here the popliteal ligaments here and you can see um, what else can we see the joint capsule bursa and you see the muscles of the gastrocnemius crossing the knee here's your popliteus muscle coming down through here like this and it's missing a lot of muscles but this would be the posterior part of the uh, or popliteal fossa right in here now Here's another one showing the ligaments that stabilize the knee. You have the anterior cruciate and the posterior cruciate. And then you see your meniscus. There's a medial meniscus, a lateral meniscus. There is your medial collateral ligament. There's your lateral collateral ligament. The shoulder joint has it's more than a glenohumeral joint, but let's just talk about the glenohumeral joint mostly here. If you want to see more about the shoulder for yourself, I have that PowerPoint set up there, and it talks about the seven articulations of the shoulder and the 20 muscles that move the shoulder. So we have the shoulder joint, the glenohumeral joint. It's a ball and socket. It is definitely freely movable, diathrodial. It has a joint between the head of the humerus and the glenoid cavity. And then there's, it has the greatest range of motion of any joint in the body. It's most frequently dislocated joint. It's supported by skeletal muscles, tendons, and ligaments. Now, there's a thing called the glenoid labrum, which I discussed pretty well in the other video for OT if you want to learn more. It's actually a rim of cartilage. It's a fibrocartilage-like rim that's Imagine you put it on into the glenoid cavity and it has a lip going around to make it a little bit deeper. But it's flexible, that glenoid labrum. It can give a little bit. That's the good part about it. It depends on the health of the disc because it's made out of fibrocartilage, the glenoid labrum. And it extends beyond the bony rim, so it makes it deeper. It actually makes it, I believe, 75% deeper than it was before. So it allows the head of the humerus to go into something a little more substantial than just kind of hanging out there. And the acromion process of the scapula and the coracoid process of the scapula, they project out and they help. They have ligaments that go to those to help stabilize the, the humerus. So some of the shoulder ligaments are the acromioclavicular ligament that goes from the acromion process to the clavicle, the coracoclavicular goes from the coracoid process to the clavicle and the coracoacromial for both to each other. And then there's the coracohumeral ligaments and the glenohumeral ligaments. If you have a shoulder separation, it could be partial or a complete dislocation of the acromioclavicular joint. Now, the muscles of the rotator cuff are extremely important when we talk about the shoulder. Those are four important muscles, the sits muscles supraspinatus, infraspinatus, teres minor, and subscapularis. Most of the strength of the shoulder is based upon those muscles. Then there are these, these uh, bursae 
you got one under the deltoid, one under the coracoid, one under the uh, chromium, and one subscap. Now, if you look at this image, I want you to identify the glenoid labrum at the bottom, the pink. Not the pink. The pink is the synovial membrane. Then you go to the right of it, and it just shows you a little bit of a lip. It doesn't do it any justice. The lip surrounds the whole glenoid. Right? Here again, you can see the glenoid cavity in the center, in the blue. And then do we see the... the uh, we can see the coracohumeral ligaments. Now, the coracohumeral ligaments are part of the fibrous sheath that surrounds it, and they become the strength of that shoulder, too. And if you look outside the center of the glenoid cavity, you see the rim of the glenoid labrum. Now, you can see a lot of tendons and muscles coming through there. So we're going to be going over those muscles really soon. You can see the ligaments here. So get to know this image for the lab, okay? This will be in the lab. Okay, so the hip joint between the head of the femur and the acetabulum of the hip is a strong ball and socket, diathroidal joint, has a wide range of motion, but not quite like the shoulder. It does have an acetabular labrum, which is a rim of fibrocartilage, increasing the depth, and it helps to seal the synovial fluid. Ligaments of the hip joint are the iliofemoral, pubofemoral, ischiofemoral, transverse acetabula, and the ligament of the femoral head. So that ligament of the femoral head is going to go into the fovea capitis of the femur. Okay, and get to know this image as well. And then this image is showing you the outside of the fibrous capsule. So this pubic femoral ligament, the greater trochanter showing there with the iliofemoral ligament as well. Again, here's the outer ligaments there. Now, what are some of the effects of aging on joints? Arthritis. Now, there's two basic types of arthritis. There's osteoarthritis, which is caused by bad wear and tear. See that on the bottom? That's a bad wear and tear. It's also called DJD, degenerative joint disease. And that's usually caused by bad wear and tear of a joint. And there are many reasons, but one number one reason is malaligned bones and you keep using it. So by the time you get over age 60, if they were malaligned and they never corrected it, it, those joints will wear out pretty bad. And then rheumatism is a aspect of, it's a term used for the pain and sw uh, stiffness, but there's different types of arthritis. There's osteoarthritis, which is bad wear and tear, and there's nothing that would show up in your blood. And then there's type of arthritis like rheumatoid arthritis which is a metabolic arthritis and if you have a metabolic arthritis that means there's some sort of blood factor and there's something in your body attacking itself usually autoimmune so rheumatoid arthritis is a inflammatory condition and that is a metabolic arthritis i want you to write that down and it has a rheumatoid factor it's an immune system. Your body's attacking itself. Gout is another one, and it has a factor. Uric acid crystals are found within a synovial joint. There are many other types of metabolic diseases. Lupus would be one, a metabolic arthritis. It's a collagen disease, and it goes on. So degenerative changes can be caused from joint immobilization as well. So if a joint's not moving well for a long period of time, it reduces the flow of synovial fluid. It also can cause symptoms of arthritis. And what people don't realize is that the joints have nerves in there and it detects changes and it changes the muscle tone. So by not moving that joint, the muscles tighten up even further. Sometimes it can be treated by passive motion machines, continuous passive motion. I would say spinal adjustment. Um, not just spinal manipulation, exercises, and stretching. And as we age, the bone mass decreases and the bones weaken, so we have a higher risk of fractures too. Now, living bones undergo remodeling that, and that we talked about that, bone formation and the breaking down of bone. And they will remodel based upon the stresses on it. So wherever the stress is greater, that's where the bone gets thicker.
There's something called Wolf's Law, W-O-L-F apostrophe S. Wolf's Law is relates to the fact wherever there's weight bearing and stress, that's where the bone is going to be thickest. So there are also factors affecting the balance between bone formation, such as age and physical stress, like I just said, hormone levels, calcium and phosphorus uptake, and the genetic or environmental factors. Other systems interact with the skeletal system, such as the muscles attaching to bones, the endocrine system we learned about, and when we, I say learned about, we learned about PTH and calcitonin, right, and how it affects, and also we learned about steroids, such as testosterone and, and, and estrogen. <clears throat> And even cortisone can affect bone density too. So the digestive and urinary systems provide calcium and phosphate materials to the bone, providing you're getting enough sunlight and you're making the calcitriol. The skeleton serves as a reservoir for calcium and phosphate. We learned about that. So integration of the skeletal system with other parts of the body, the integumentary system helps to remove excess body heat synthesizes vitamin D for calcium and phosphate absorption and protects the underlying bones and joints. But the skeletal system provides support for the skin. The skeletal system also performs several major body functions for the human. It provides structural support, stores the calcium and phosphate and other minerals. It also can store lipids as an energy reserve it produces the blood cells, hemopoiesis. It protects many soft tissues and organs and provides leverage for movements generated by skeletal muscles.